what I learned was, is my early fuel sources were all negative. And, you know, those, that strategy only works for a certain period of time. And it does result in you being empty. Um, but the positive fuel sources that I now utilize, uh, you know, they're very much uh, replenishing and renewing. And, you know, and, and so that's the desire to contribute, the desire to serve, purpose, the calling. Um, you know, I, I'm not looking at uh, how much like revenue I'm making. Revenue is a byproduct of the success that we create for our clients. Revenue is a byproduct of the team members and the efficiency of my team members and how my team members are you know, operating together in a productive environment, right? My culture creates the revenue. My revenue isn't created. So my fuel sources are different now and they result in you know, big numbers, but the source is just differently. And so when the numbers arrive, as opposed to gratifying ego and going and buying something stupid, you know, I, I thank God, I get on my knees, I pray. And you know, I ask myself, what am I supposed to steward this money for? Where am I supposed to invest it? And I have a much different relationship with money now than I used to have. And that's what I mm -hmm. teach entrepreneurs to do. Welcome Ryan Blair. He's the number one New York Times bestselling author and serial entrepreneur. He went from a wayward youth to businessman with over 2 billion in company sales. After decades of building successful companies, Ryan began his latest company, Alter Call, which uplifts and helps entrepreneurs scale their companies using spiritual modalities. He's a former CEO of Visalis, which is known for the Body by VI 90 Day Challenge. In 2012, he sold Visalis for $792 million. He is also the New York Times bestselling author of the book, Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain. All right, I have the honor on welcoming on Ryan Blair on Passion Love Pursuit podcast. It is uh, just an absolute honor to connect with you. And of course, as we're jamming before we press record, uh, just to get to know you better, we're both in the Los Angeles area. And I know, of course, I've heard your story. I knew, I know you grew up in Los Angeles at the prime time when there was a lot of hip hop gangs and all the crazy craziness and all the LA area. So I'm very familiar with it because I'm actually from Los Angeles originally. So mm -hmm. I've been around this whole thing for a long time. But uh, I know you've shared your story many, many times, and I'm sure sometimes it gets like repetitive, but I think it's so important for people to listen to your background because it really shows people that where you come from does not necessarily determine where you're going to go. And it all, you know, it's by changing your mindset, changing your actions, and, you know, really uh, changing that environment the external and internal environment. And that really changes your trajectory of your life. And so very much your story is that. So if you could kind of uh, lay it on us, like where, like take us back to, as I mentioned, you growing up, or I don't know if you didn't actually grow up in Los Angeles. I grew up just outside Los Angeles in the okay. San Fernando Valley area. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. But, so you know, yeah, if you could when you're, take us back. Oh yeah. When you live in the area, pretty much to the rest of the world, we live in Los Angeles, but to us, there's like six to 10 different cities around here. Um, so you know, I, you know, I have, I have told the story a lot of times, but it, it, it never bothers me to tell it again because it's really a blessing to me to have experienced a diverse array of adversities and to have learned from those adversities and converted them into wisdom and knowledge that I now get to share. So I'm happy to dive as deep into any subject as possible. You know, being that I've written books about the story and there's been a movie made about it, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I've recently gone back and revisited it in a way that I hadn't before. And the other day I was uh, driving and my navigation took me by the house that I grew up in. And it was the house that I lived in when my father and my mother and I were together before drugs had torn apart the family. And we were in the middle class. And I saw kids riding their bicycles around, having fun. Uh, and I, I have a 13-year-old boy myself. And I was like, wow, like, this is what was ripped away from me. My identity was in the middle class. My identity was that I got new 
clothing come school time, that I had wonderful presents underneath the Christmas tree, that I was on baseball, soccer, basketball, football teams. Like I was living the perfect life and the best life that I could understand. And, you know, and by all means in my peer group, you know, I had it great. At least that's what I thought. And, you know, my home, though, was was filled on the inside. The wall. On the outside of the walls, it was beautiful. On the inside of the walls, though, it was filled with violence and drug addiction and abuse. But, you know, that's just how I was raised. So I didn't know any different. I didn't know that it was like serious trauma that we were being exposed to and that I was witnessing. I didn't know the effects of that later on in life. I just thought that's what my life was like, that every dad was a violent dad when you crossed mm-hmm. them. And my dad got severely addicted to a drug's to drugs when I was, uh, it started when I was about 11, at least it started to be noticeable. And then by the time I was 13 years old, he had a psychotic break and he threatened to kill me and he, you know, put it all on me. Um, and I had to flee the environment and I was forced to go live in a tiny little Turkey shed. And I was 13 years old. And I was also reflecting on this the other day that, you know, like I was just like for it. I was like, all right, I'm on my own now. I'm 13. Let's go. And, you know, I couldn't imagine my son being 13, just being like, you're out, go fend for yourself and figure it out. Like I would never dawn on me to do that to someone, but that's just the parental environment that I had. And so at 13, I was on my own. And, and when you move into, when you go from the middle class and you have that identity and all of a sudden you're in poverty, you got to choose a new identity because the middle class identity isn't going to get you anywhere in poverty. And so I started hanging around kids, getting tattoos. You can't really see too many of them. But I got 13 years old. I started getting tattooed with, you know, homemade tattoo guns. And, um, and in the environment that I was in, you were constantly being uh, threatened. There were rival gangs driving around. You would, you would get asked where you were from, like, what gang are you from constantly? And so you kind of had to choose sides or you'd forever be antagonized by all sides. And um, I, I was forced to choose sides when my sister's best friend and my first childhood uh, crush and first girl I ever kissed was murdered in a drive-by shooting. Her name was Jennifer Jordan. And when she was murdered, not only did that strike a chord within me, but all of the other kids in my neighborhood were like, we're gonna go retaliate. And so they forced me into the gang to go retaliate against this other gang that was basically going to try to kill people in our neighborhood and they were doing it. And so that was the first time that I really understood that, you know, I was being threatened with murder and that I had to retaliate against a murder that had happened to me and my family. And, you know, I was in the gang, I was a scrawny white kid in a primarily Latin gang. So, uh, you know, I, I stood out like a sore thumb. I had to fight each and every single day. I had to prove myself. And over time, you know, I I had a lot of anger in me and rage in me because of the upbringing that I had and the model that my father was. And so I took it all out on the streets. And um, eventually, you know, I was being arrested a number of times. I uh, was facing a prison sentence and uh, I made a decision that I was going to change my life in a jail cell one day. I was forced into solitary confinement because of fighting and they gave me a Bible and I was uh, uh, reading the Bible out loud and I had a vision that one day I'd become a preacher and I I wrote the judge a letter asking for leniency and from there um, uh, presented the letter to the judge. He gave me leniency and then next thing you know, as fate would have it, a mentor showed up into my life and then I was um, taken out of poverty because this mentor took an interest in me and I went from the identity of being a poor gang member to now all of a sudden I'm a rich kid. And so Mm -hmm. I got to see all three socioeconomic systems growing up and experience them on an intimate level, middle class, uh, you know, poverty, and then now all of a sudden wealthy. And that was a real identity shift too. And the other day when I was reflecting, it dawned on me that like, what a crazy identity change. Like in one minute, I was a rich kid. All of a sudden I'm living in a mansion on a private island with yachts in my backyard, maids, marble, any kind of food that I wanted to eat. And I'd never seen wealth like that in the middle. You know, in the middle class, I thought that we were rich, but it was Mm -hmm. all very fragile. It was ripped away from us. The home was, you know, mortgaged, the cars were foreclosed on or repossessed, I should say. And then all of a sudden now I'm in the wealthy class and they're, they're playing with money and doing things with money that I'd never dreamed of. So 
I got to see all three systems by the time I was 17 years old and live in the systems and experience the systems. And that's when I chose to be an entrepreneur. Wow. Okay. So let's unpack some of that. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I told this story. story different than I ever have. So go, oh, go awesome. unpack. Well, thank you. So, well, to my understanding, which is even crazier, weren't you the leader of this gang or did you become the leader of this gang? Yeah, I, I worked my way up into leadership. Um, oh I was what they call an enforcer, which meant that my job was to enforce the rules of the gang. So hmm. you really want to unpack this. You know, I was involved in a lot of violence and, and you know, it was extreme violence. And I just hmm. share that with you because, you know, it's real easy for me to package this story in a way where it's like, oh, I was in a gang and then I got a mentor and then I moved on. Yeah. And, you know, there's been a lot of, repentance that I've had to do to reconcile the fact that, you know, I was one of the most violent members of our society. Wow. It, it's so crazy to hear that, hearing like where you've come out of that, that whole identity shift. And we'll, we'll talk about identity because I think that's really important and environment. And since you do have well, let me just go into that because it's the top of mind. So you say you have a 13 year old son. And, and you were 13 when you got out, basically, when you moved into poverty and started being on the streets and kind of forming a new identity. When it comes to environment, being a father, how, how do you help your son create an environment that will help him succeed? Because that is really one thing that I think parents want to know, like, how could I, like, some people might think, like, how do I protect my child? But I yeah. think there's, you know, that fine line. You don't want to be a helicopter mom or dad, but yet you want to make sure that they're not surrounded by an unhealthy environment. So what would you say being a father um, and going back to your past, if you want to say? Yeah. Well, you know, my job as a father is to transfer my wisdom and my love and, and values that I've learned, that I've cultivated and refined onto him so he doesn't make the same mistakes that I've made. And also to teach him about the things that I've learned around relationships and friendships. And, you know, he lives in a different environment than I've ever imagined. Like he's growing up as a rich kid. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it's a weird thing for me to say this, but, you know, people will steal from him. Um, you know, he'll, he has, you know, abundance. And so kids will see that and they'll be jealous of it and they'll want to take it from him. And so I have to teach him that, you know, that there's some, responsibility that comes with it. You know, we do a lot of charity uh, work together. We're always giving back. I'm looking for opportunities to give. And I try to teach him, you know, that it's so important that we share what we have. And so there's, there's a lot of different types of lessons that he has to learn than the ones that I had to learn. But you're absolutely correct. And that environment is, is everything. And so, you know, I'm very, I'm very uh, careful. I ask my son a few questions every single day. And I say, you know, who did, who did you spend your time with today? And I want to know about his environment. You know, who are his friends? What'd you learn? All right. What'd you learn today? And then, you know, what, what did you learn about yourself that you want to improve upon? And every single day I'm asking him these questions so I can better understand the environment that he's in. And then I can better coach him, you know, to upgrade his environment. And there's been times where he's had friends where I've said, you know, this isn't a good friend. This person is not for you. And, you know, it was devastating for him to hear that and to experience that and to, you know, to, to understand that he was not being treated with the respect that he deserved. And, you know, and then I've, I've helped him say, okay, well, let's go find new friends now. Let's, let's see. We just went to Halloween Horror Nights, which is not too far away. And we had a whole plan as to who we were going to invite to Halloween Horror Nights and, and how we were going to make friends. And, you know, and uh, I was teaching him how to cultivate friendships that were going to be for him as opposed to ones that were going to be jealous of him. Mm. I love that. I think it's important as a parent. And I think with today's world, especially being that we both live in Los Angeles, there is a lot of noise, if you want to say a lot of left leaning, right leaning, every leaning. So there's a lot of things that are influencing kids these days. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I've contemplated a lot about, because I, I've known parents that are very strict, no TV, no social media, no exposure to the outside world. And I think that's a bad strategy. I would rather have a relationship with my son where when he is exposed, we can talk about it. And he's, he's been exposed to some things that living in Los Angeles that, you know, are weird stuff. Like we we're driving down the street and we saw somebody doing something one day that, you know, wasn't appropriate. And, 
you know, he's like, dad, what, what did I just see? And, you know, I, I have an open relationship with my son. We talk about these things. And so I know that he's going to be exposed in the world that we live in to a lot of things that I wish he wouldn't, but I'd rather have him be exposed to those things and have a relationship with me where he brings them to me and we can have real discussions about them. And I don't shame him or make him feel guilty. I try to explain to him why exposure to this or exposure to that can have some long-term repercussions to it. And it can be you know, something that we don't want to bring into our lives because when we bring in you know, that kind of energy into our lives, you know, there's some unintended consequences that can occur. And so like, I'll literally sit him down and explain to him the unintended consequences of some of the things and some of the conduct that he's going to be exposed to and that he has been exposed to. And so that's my approach is more, you know, I, I'm going to go with the flow. Whatever comes my way, I'm going to try to work with it as opposed to try to create a walled garden and hope my son doesn't get exposed to some of the things he's exposed to. And he's on, uh, you know, TikTok and he's on YouTube and he's watching YouTubers do stupid things and they're make, saying stupid things. And, you know, and he, then, you know, he'll laugh at it or he'll bring it to me and I'll be like, all right, here's the way we should think about this. And that's my goal is to be, you know, the best father I can be and the best mentor to him that I can be. Absolutely. I completely agree. I think it's great to kind of let them, uh, and I also coming or going back to your environment and what you experienced, which was a lot of challenges, a lot of hard times, a lot of trauma. So coming from that environment, what do you feel is some of the biggest lessons you've taken with you into your life today? I know that's probably a loaded question because yeah. I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> well, you know, one, I'm, I'm proud to say I've never uh, spanked my son. I've never uh, been physical with him or hit him or, or uh, uh, been very punishing to him, like, you know, grounded him or tried to punish him. You know, we have had challenges and I've taught him forgiveness and I've taught him that, you know, I forgive you unconditionally and immediately the moment that you accept responsibility and vice versa. I'm often going to him for forgiveness. See, the household that I lived in, if you did something wrong, you were punished. You'd be grounded for like a week and you'd be humiliated and, and you know, maybe beaten up, often beaten up. And it was bad. It was like, you know, we were afraid to, to be, you know, human. We we're afraid to be kids because it could come with some severe consequences. And that's just not the way I parent. And my, you know, my son makes mistakes, but I make mistakes too. So, when the teacher, you know, gets upset, I say, okay, we're going to sit down and talk about this. I'm going to explain to you why this is upsetting. And, you know, and then he'll reconcile it. He'll take responsibility. He'll take ownership and he'll apologize. And, and then the problem's resolved in our household. So I think that's key is, you know, I teach forgiveness in this household and, and I live by forgiveness in my life. Beautiful. It's so important. I think a lot of people don't realize how much forgiveness takes such weight off your shoulders. It doesn't necessarily matter about the other person. It's really like cleaning your your emotions, your house, and then being able to come from a place of love and compassion without this weight on your shoulders. So I think it's it's a beautiful thing, especially to teach children. Uh, the yeah, think, I mean, think about it. Parents don't teach that. We we actually we we punish children. We we humiliate them. We take away social interaction. We make them feel like they're unloved. Like that's how we're going to, we're, we're mad at them for doing something, you know, and oftentimes parents are mad at their children for doing something that uh, reflects badly on them. So they're, they're not mad because the child did something that, you know, hurt them or, or, you know, or, or uh, put them in a, a, a bad, bad position, position. They're mad because it made them look bad. Mm. Right. And so mm -hmm. most parents are programming their children not to be conscious uh, people. And so I, I do my best to live a conscious life as much as I can. I'm not perfect by any means. And then I try to teach my son as I'm learning. And, you know, that's, that's my, my method of parenting. And when you ask specifically, you know, how have I, you know, how, what adjustments have I made as a result of the way I was raised? And it's, you know, it's primarily that it's, you know, uh, faith, spirituality, repentance, forgiveness, um, and I'm a Christian. And so I teach Christian values to my son and we try to live by Christian values. Beautiful. So let's kind of transition because I want to make sure I get all, all the good stuff out of you. So you okay. talked about when you got out of your sentence, uh, you had a mentor that basically took you in. Uh, first of all, I'm curious, why did he have the confidence in you that you could 
be entrepreneur and transition to your life into something better than where you came from. What do you think he saw in you? Well, he, so he gave me a challenge. Um, he, uh, he asked me to listen to a series of audiobooks. It was the first time I'd ever listened to any personal growth material or read any books. I'd, in fact, never read a, a book um, you know, prior to that. I was a high school dropout. And the audio book was called Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it talked about purpose and it talked about how, you know, people could overcome insurmountable obstacles and adversities to become successful. And when I listened to that, I was mesmerized. I, I, I listened to that audio tape series uh, day in and day out. I'd be on the basketball court listening to it. I go to sleep at night, and when the back in the days we had uh, cassette tapes, when the tape would pop, I would flip it back over. I'd wake up to change the tape because I wanted to program myself to this material. And when he asked me one day, you know, what I thought about it, I could recite it word for word. And he's like, "You're a genius." I'm like, "What? No one's ever called me a genius before." He says, "I can't. I've listened to this my whole life." He said, "I can't recite this word for word." And I I knew the the whole material inside and out, and I could recite it. And so when he saw that and he believed me to be somebody special because I'd shown an aptitude, you know, for learning this type of content, um, then, you know, he, uh, he, he sponsored me. He, he uh, insisted I went to a community college. He gave me a job repairing his computers. And, you know, he kept giving me books and feeding me information. And yes. I was hungry for it. I, I ate as, uh, up as much information as he would give me. I would ask him hundreds of questions. And, you know, uh, he became my model and, and I wanted to be like him basically as an entrepreneur. And that was, that was the initial inspiration. The other thing that I have to tell you is that he started dating my mother. And so my mom was whispering in his ear to, you know, anytime I'd mess up or I'd be disrespectful, you know, she would try to bring us back together and reconcile it. And so I, I wasn't a perfect, uh, mentee by any means. Um, but you know, I, I did my best to learn as much as I could from him and he's no longer with us. And so in my books, mm -hmm. I pay tribute to the wisdom that he taught me. And, and it's because of him that I became an entrepreneur. Wow. So remarkable. Okay. So, and, uh, I did an intro at the beginning of this interview and you have become quite the entrepreneur and you've had massive exits. So let's talk about a little bit of your entrepreneurship journey. Like how did you really where was like that big step that you took into your entrepreneurship journey that really just like up leveled your game and, and influenced everything you did from there on? Well, you know, I was, I was always money motivated growing up and, you know, my dad would use uh, compensation to drive behavior. So if I got a certain amount of base hits in a baseball game, I would get a new batting glove glove or if I washed the car and did this and did that, I would get money. And so I, you know, I always had um, to earn money and he used it to drive behavior in me. So I had that early on instilled and I had two paper routes. I had lemonade stands. I was always trying to figure out a way to get money so I could get stuff because, you know, even when we lived in the middle of class, middle class, you know, my parents, you know, didn't, you know, give us a lot of stuff. Uh, we had nice environment, but if I wanted something, I had to earn it, which was a great way to you know be taught um when i was in a gang i was very entrepreneurial because when you're in a gang it is basically an entrepreneurial system a gang is an illegal enterprise and so there's a hierarchy there's uh you know income sources there's you know different uh weight rackets to make money and so forth so poverty is a very entrepreneurial environment believe it or not the middle class is actually less entrepreneurial and then you know when i when i started working for my mentor I saw that he was in real estate or then, I mean, I worked for him in real estate. I saw the way he made money and I didn't like it because it was hard work. You had to, you know, do physical labor a lot. We would buy for uh, homes and we'd have to you know, tear them down and build them up. And I'd have to change out toilets and evict people. And, and so I wanted to do computers and I, I got really fascinated by computer sciences. And it just so happened that I had developed an aptitude for computer sciences at a time when the industry was uh, taking off in the late nineties. And so I started my career as an entrepreneur in the computer sciences field in a company called 24 seven tech. And then later on, I started a company called sky pipeline. And then, you know, now I've been involved in a number of different startups and 
uh, in you know technology, life sciences, and a variety of other uh, areas. Amazing. And what would you say if you were to maybe say three skills that you feel is necessary to create massive success as an entrepreneur? Leadership. I'm sure there's more than three, but. Yeah, leadership, leadership, and leadership. And and by leadership, I would say self-leadership. You, entrepreneurship is the most humbling profession one can be in. You're going to get rejected by investors, team members, customers, you're going to have challenges, you're going to have all kinds, the economy is going to give you challenges. It is a very risk heavy, risk intensive environment. And it's very challenging. So you have to, you know, have the skill of self leadership and, and you know, self mastery. And you have to have the skill of leadership, like those are the two fundamentals. But then there's a number of other fundamental skills that are required. Um, you know, depending on what type of business that you're, you're going to run. And I would say like foundational, you also have to have, you know, um, an understanding of money and a desire to, to generate it and produce it. Because, you know, because I, I had a dream, I wanted to make billions of dollars. I didn't want to make millions. In fact, you know, once I made my first million, I, I didn't really uh, care about it at all. That was not the destination. It was like, I wanted to make billions. And so, I had this desi- deep, big desire for big numbers and to be able to create big systems and big companies. And so I would say the third skill other than self-leadership and people leadership would be, you know, you need to have the skill of a vision and, and, mm. um, and, you know, a big, big desire inside of you. You need to be able to cultivate big desire to do something at, at scale. You can be a great entrepreneur, um, you know, and, and run a small company and that's, that's very noble. And it's still also very difficult, but to do something very big, you have to have a big desire. Yeah. Well, actually, let's talk about that because I know you're driven by the money, right? You specifically just said that right now. And I know where you've transitioned over the last years, which is remarkable, which we'll go into because that's like the icing on the cake for me. But uh for entrepreneurs that are very driven by the money, like they want to obtain more and more and more and they're never satisfied, but then when they hit a goal per se, then they feel still empty. Yeah. Can you kind of speak to that? Because I know this kind yeah. of goes into the work you're doing today, which is absolutely yeah. remarkable and I'm in love with it. So I would love right. like like the entrepreneurs that you meet commonly, that you mentor, do you feel that's a common theme that these entrepreneurs that have massive success, they're just unfulfilled, lacking purpose, lacking vision? Yeah. Well, when you're extremely driven, you're driven by something, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's some fuel source that's powering you and there's negative fuels and then there's positive fuels and, and negative fuels are a great source to be driven to accomplish a lot. And that might be, you want to prove yourself. You want to, um, you want to get back at somebody. You want to, you know, control an environment like, you know, control or ego, those are all the negative drivers. And, and those drivers can drive a person, you know, to incredible heights, but they're poison, they're poisonous. And, and the, the higher you get, the more poison you're ingesting with those fuels. And then there's the fuel sources that are uh, much more sustainable. And, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, there's unlimited supplies of them. See that negative fuel sources, it's like, I'm driven. I want, I want to buy a car because I want to prove my ex-girlfriend wrong. And it's like, I get the car and then I need to get another car because someone else has a better car. And you know, that fuel source is very depleting. Mm -hmm. And then there's the unlimited fuel sources that actually refill you as you utilize these sources. And those are, those are the fuel sources of purpose and of a spiritual calling like I have. And what I learned was, is my early fuel sources were all negative. And you know, those, that strategy only works for a certain period of time. And it does result in you being empty. Um, but the positive fuel sources that I now utilize, uh, you know, they're very much uh, replenishing and renewing and, you know, and, and so that's the desire to contribute, the desire to serve purpose, the calling, um, you know, I, I'm not looking at, uh, how much like revenue I'm making revenue is a byproduct of the success that we create for our clients. Revenue is a byproduct of the team members and the efficiency of my team members and how my team members are you know, operating together in a productive environment, right? My culture creates the revenue. My revenue isn't created. So 
my fuel sources are different now and they result in, you know, big numbers, but the source is just differently. And so when the numbers arrive, as opposed to gratifying ego and going and buying something stupid, you know, I, I thank God, I get on my knees, I pray. And, you know, I ask myself, what am I supposed to steward this money for? Where am I supposed to invest it? And I have a much different relationship with money now than I used to have. And that's what I mm -hmm. teach entrepreneurs to do. But you have to be driven to have this problem. So there's kind of two types of people. There's the people that never are driven to overachieve and they don't know this problem at all. And then there's the overachievers that know this problem very well, right? Where they're like, I was driven to overachieve. I overachieved and it wasn't all that it was, you know, what, what I was sold. I was sold that if I got, you know, great grades and went to a great school and got a great job, I'd be happy. And I did all of that and then I wasn't happy. And so, you know, it's a rare group of people that actually has the desire, does something with it, and then realizes that the end destination wasn't, you know, what they thought it was going to be. And that tends to be the group of people that I work with on a deep level because, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's once you get to the top of the mountain and you realize that it's just rock, that can be a very devastating uh, realization. Absolutely. So I would love to hear how your transition uh, from where you were really like dr driven by money and then you uh, transition at some point in your life more into your spiritual wellness and coming from a different vision and drive. Can you kind of share what was that, what was it maybe the catalyst to that? Because I, yeah. to my knowledge, like you said, you were studying a Bible when you were in jail but was yeah. this always a part of you, uh, being a Christian, very faith forward? Visionary? Yeah. So I, I had, um, some real demons, you know, I just, I hit them and I hit them very well. And I channeled them into very uh, productive actions, you know, in our, our society's viewpoint. So, you know, this aggression and this anger and all of the stuff that I had inside of me, you know, was, was fuel sources. And, you know, that strategy ran its course. And then I crashed, uh, like a lot of people do. And as I was crashing, as fate would have it, my son was going through a, a, a serious health challenge with autism. My mother uh, had relapsed into alcohol and had fallen down a flight of stairs. My mentor had died unexpectedly in my arms. And then my mother transitions and I broke. I broke wide open. It was the best way to describe it was an awakening. You know, I, I was alone. I was in, uh, you know, a beautiful mansion in the Hollywood Hills. And, and I was like, I'd burn this house down right now. Like everything that I have, everything that I own, owned me. I had lawsuits against me. I had fair weather friends. I was in deep grief and pain. And, you know, I was just like, I'm blowing this, this whole thing up. I'm, I'm, I'm burning up the identity that I had created. And that identity was this playboy, decadent, rock star, you know, filthy rich identity. And, I, and, you know, and our society really rewards that identity. And I was like, this identity is over. And, but I was always spiritual. I was just resisting it because of the exposure that I, you know, I went through and the negativity that I experienced and endured and the fact that I'd never healed it that that was always with me. It was just mm -hmm. manifesting in different ways. So once my mother transitioned, you know, as she was transitioning, I had the, I had an uh, intuitive hit that told me it was time to go say goodbye to her. I went and said goodbye to her and we made a deal. And, you know, I said, mom, I need you to transition. Uh, so that way I can become the leader I'm destined to be. And when she transitioned, you know, my whole life changed. It was though, as though I could feel her presence with me. Um, I felt a deep spiritual connection. I could feel her energy. She would come to me in my dreams. All kinds of interesting spiritual things were happening to me. And so at that point in time, I just said, I'm, I'm going to do the spiritual path. And I made a decision to God, you know, my creator. And I said that I'm going to, I'll change anything and everything there is about me in order for me to become the leader that I told my mom I was mm -hmm. committed to be. And, and a leader for my father as well. And so it's been five years that I've you know, worked very hard at that. And by hard work, I mean, you know, for the first two years, I dedicated 16 hours a day towards, you know, healing modalities, meditation, breath work, sound healing, um, journaling, writing, 
saltwater baths, hikes in nature, vegan food, like anything and everything that I could take up in that two year period of time, I took up to try to change me from the inside out. And then as mm -hmm. I got further in the journey, I started mentoring others. And now I have a, you know, an organization that's dedicated to mentoring people who are on their healing and growth journey as well. So remarkable. And you said one thing that the more you own, the more it owns you. Yeah. which I think is a really powerful statement uh, because I think that's the thing. When people are successful, they tend to possess more things, right? So being that you went through this transition, you did all the inner work, uh, all these spiritual practices that really transitioned you into changing your identity, what would you say to those people that if maybe to give them kind of this aha moment that – success isn't all about obtaining all these things, that there's much deeper meaning and purpose to it. And that brings kind of, I mean, if you want to start talking about your company, Alter Call, because I think that's exactly what that is. But I think that's a really aha statement, uh, what, you, what you just said. Yeah. You know, my, my first book was Nothing to Lose. And when I owned all of these things, I felt like I had everything to lose. Like I felt like a complete hypocrite, like the energy that made me successful was this idea that I had nothing to lose. Like I go all in. And then I had four houses on the same street. I had tenants. I had, you know, all kinds of investments that I had to look after all of these things. And I was like, I'm no longer creative. I'm no longer um, moving quickly and taking risk. I'm now afraid. I wake up every single day with everything to lose as opposed to you know, having the mindset that got me to where I was. And so really evaluating, you know, the juxtaposition there, I realized that all of the things that I owned actually owned me. And the more things that I accumulated, the more worries I had, you know, worrying about your watch collection getting stolen, worrying about, you know, this happening, that happening, security cameras everywhere. It was just, it was a ridiculous way to live. I didn't, I didn't like it at all. And it wasn't for me. Now I have friends that literally are so rich that their annual lifestyle expenses are like a hundred million a year. And it's just like when, you know, your expenses for the homes you own and the jets that you operate and all of those things cost you a hundred million a year. Like that's a whole lot of, of responsibility and things that you have to interface with. And it's not as glamorous as you might think. Now I live a very uh, successful life and, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. You know, I'm, I, you know, I, I have uh you know, uh, a wonderful environment. And, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I have a lot of responsibility, so I'm not minimizing that by any means, but, you know, last thing in the world I want is, um, you know, to have nonstop things that I have to worry about all day long. I want to create, I want to make the world a better place. I want to build something. And the more of these things that, you know, you accumulate, the more that takes away from your creativity and, and it, it you know, creates stress and pressure. And some people need that stress and pressure to produce. I don't. I can, I can find a fuel source that uh, makes me extremely productive other than stress, pressure, and fear. But some people like to, you know, buy the jet and the bigger house and the car and the this and the that so they can put themselves into this stress and pressure so that they can produce. And mm -hmm. I'm just here to tell you, you can choose whatever fuel source you want. And there are far better fuel sources than fuel, stress, and pressure to produce, but that's totally up to you. So hopefully that's the aha moment that uh, you were looking for. Yeah. And so let's talk about Alter Call. What is your mission behind Alter Call and who is it for? Alter Call is a community of leaders and most of us are entrepreneurs or we lead organizations. And we, we, we lead in a different way though. We, we seek first to master ourselves so that we can lead people to help you know, them master their craft as well and themselves in that, for that matter. We, um, we primarily work with entrepreneurs that see their businesses as an opportunity to create change in the world. You know, we all know that there's a ton of problems out there. And so, you know, as opposed to being a venture capitalist like I once was, I now mentor and work with entrepreneurs and help them expand and scale their businesses to make the most efficient and productive impact they possibly can so that they can be uh, a generous person so that they can be charitable in nature so that they can take care of their family and create a legacy for themselves 
in such a way that makes the world better than they found it. And so we have a community of several hundred leaders, actually several thousand leaders now, and every single day, new people join us to learn how to lead themselves, their families, and their businesses in a way that creates change in the world. And so basically, we're just a bunch of people that have this deep down desire to change the world. And we realize that doing it together is the most effective way for us to, to affect that change. Amazing. Love it. Love it. I love the mission. And so let's talk about your spiritual practices a little bit, because I know this is the cornerstone of your life. Like this is one of the pillars of your life. That's very important. So what would, I I know you mentioned some of your spiritual practices that you did during those two years, but what is like your non-negotiables every day? And how has that served you in your business today, opposed to how it was previously? Well, you know, so my non-negotiables are uh, everything that adds light into my life is my non-negotiables. Mm-hmm. There are many things that take light out of my life. They deplete me. And it's an energetic thing. It, it's just for me particularly. Like if I have to resolve a conflict, that can be depleting. And, you know, and, and, you know I'm giving energy, not receiving a lot of energy in that. But I have to do that every day. And so I sequence the things that fill up my cup with the things that drain my cup so that I'm always serving from a full cup. Mm. I don't deplete my cup and then serve from an empty cup and then complain about exhaustion and being tired and overworked and all of these things that you know many entrepreneurs complain about, being burnt out. The reason why they're burnt out is because they're serving from an empty cup. And so my methodology is to fill up my cup each and every single day as much as I can. So I'm serving from the overflow. So I have an abundance to serve from. And when something drains me, I recognize that. I check in. I feel it. And then I go fill myself back up. The things that fill me up are pretty simple. It's a you know, sunrise hike. It's time with my dog, with my son. It's meditation. The most uh, fun thing that I do, not fun thing, but the thing that I love to do the most is a saltwater bath. I love just making a nice hot bath, listening to classical music and just tuning out and meditating and, and, you know, recharging that way. I eat very healthy, drink a lot of water. I uh, abstain from any toxic substances, relationships and ways of being. I, you know, I restrict the things that waste my time as best as I can. I'm not perfect by any means, but I, I, you know, the, the big vices are all, you know, uh, mitigated at this point in my journey. And so, I'm not, I'm dealing with basically a process of elimination. So by doing all of these things all day long, I only have a certain amount of time to be productive. And so the time that I have to be productive is, is generally put, you know, to great use because my priorities are first and foremost, the things that bring light into my life. And the more that I prioritize that, the more that I step into a level of self mastery and a level of energy that uh, can bring out the most productivity in me and the team members that I get to interface with, as opposed to draining myself and then showing up in a poor energetic state, tired, angry, aggressive, uh, you know, and trying to lead the team that way. I realize that if I bring pure, conscious and excited, enthusiastic, passionate, purposeful energy to every meeting, that my meetings are more effective. My conversations are more clear. I get better results in life. And so when I, really developed a system. It was like, why, why are we not making our energy management our highest priority in business? Because when you get the energy management right, you'll get the time management right. And when you get the time management right, you'll get the money management right. Because there time and money are correlated, right? And money and, ener- and uh, energy and, and time are correlated. So my system is real simple. I just basically focus on cultivating the greatest energy I possibly can to be of the greatest service I possibly can be. And then I bring that energy to every meeting you know, I can. And I'm not perfect by any means. I, I make adjustments. I might get, sometimes I wake up too early. Like this morning I woke up at 3 a.m. and I was like, all right, gonna have to take a nap today. And, you know, and I don't wanna wake up at 3 a.m. every day. That's not the perfect optimized time for me. And so, you know, I'll, I'll make adjustments and dial it in. And, and every day I, I get a little better. And as the seasons change, so does my energy management system changes because we often think that we just want to get one habit and then have that habit for the rest of our lives. And every habit has a half-life and, you know, and even positive habits need to be changed out and the pattern needs to be switched up uh, from time to time. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, I think it's so great what you mentioned. I think the, the correlation between all those things, but energy is 
absolutely important. And like you said, filling up your cup first. I think so many people, especially uh, parents and also people that run big companies, like there's so many things pulling at them. So it will drain people's cup before they realize that like their cup's empty and they're not able to serve from that powerful place that they wish they could, you know? So I think it's so yeah. important. Uh, speaking about faith, uh, I'm a Christian as well. How, in your opinion, do you think people or how do you, you yourself lead with faith over fear? I don't know because I, I did hear on another podcast that you faced, uh, as you were talking about your son, he had autism and you had a lot of hard, hard times with that. And there's a lot of fear that comes with that. I don't, I've never uh, experienced anybody that has autism personally, but I could only imagine, especially when it's your son and watching the struggle. Yeah. How did you move through that process with faith over the fears and possibly, you know, where he was going to end up in life and social skills and whatnot? Yeah. When, you know, it was a very difficult experience for him more than me. You know, he was in tremendous pain mm. and autism is, is a very, very uh, difficult uh, disease. It's, I mean, it's painful. And that mm. pain, of course, transferred on to me because when somebody you love is in pain, you're naturally in pain too, especially, you know, in a father-son connection like we have. So it was a painful situation. There was a lot of fear in there. And, you know, I, I turned to prayer, you know, I, when, when you have no other choices, you know, the medical world wasn't going to solve the problem for me. The everything I tried wasn't going to solve the problem for me. So I had to turn to my faith in a, in a major way. And, and that's how I've created such a close relationship with God and with the creator in my life is I've had many of opportunities to have no choice but to turn to that relationship. And so as a result, I've developed a very strong relationship, um, you know, with with my creator. It's a very intimate relationship too. It's a strange thing to say. Like when people ask me about my relationship, I'm like, it's intimate. Like I'm really, I'm, I'm connected. And in fact, my execution strategy is simply obedience. You know, like every day I wake up and, you know, I execute with obedience and then I use discernment to determine on what I'm supposed to actually do today. Um, you know, I, I have a very close relationship with, with my spirituality and, and my higher power. Um, and I've cultivated that within my son too. And we've done a lot of praying together. And, and, uh, and one day I baptized him. He asked to be baptized and I took him through a baptism process. And when I took him out of the water, I looked at his eyes and they had changed. And I saw just a new boy and he no longer suffers from autism whatsoever. He is a typical 13 year old wow. and, uh, and I'm just so blessed to have it. And having had all of the fears that you described, like anything that he is going through and he struggles, it's like, it's nothing in comparison to mm. what we went through. So mm. like, you know, if, if he's in a bad mood, it doesn't affect me. Cause like, I remember when, you know, his bad moods would last 18 hours a day for six, seven days a week, you know? And I mean that not just bad moods, but like autism seizures and terror, uh, you know, they call them terrors yeah. and things like that. So, uh, you know, we live in a heavenly time right now as a result of, the healing that's happened in our family. And, and I attribute a hundred percent to my faith in the creator. Uh, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I wouldn't be alive for that matter. And nor would he be healed if it weren't for uh, the creator. And so the other thing that I'll, I'll share with you is um, as a Christian, I really just focus on this concept called the fruits of the spirit and it's love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, joy, gentleness, uh, faithfulness, and self-control. There's nine of them. And those nine fruits of the spirit, I ask myself each and every single day, how am I doing in that? And when I'm outside of that, I go like, is that a fruit of the spirit? Like that Ryan that just walked in the room, did he walk in fully clothed in the Holy Spirit embodying the fruits of the spirit? Or was that a Ryan that was embodying something other than the fruits of the spirit? And so my personal growth journey and spiritual journey is just to embody the fruits of the spirit more often than not. And, you know, to get better at that embodiment as I go. I love it that you do that check-in too. It's important. Like, as you mentioned, like you have that reference. So you could always return to that. Like, 
is and and check off like okay maybe I need to work on that that's beautiful I love that thank you for sharing that oh thank my gosh you. there's so much goodness there's so many aspects of your story and I've kind of wanted to touch on a whole bunch uh, because I've enjoyed learning about you and just your your journey and there's just so so much to learn from you and also of course I think people should definitely check out Alter Call so I'll include that in the show notes and of course your book your most recent book uh, Rock Bottom to Rock Star is that yeah. what's called yeah that's it <laughs> yep uh, if you were so let me just I'm going to ask you my my question that I ask every guest. I was going to ask you something else, but then it would probably be the same answer. So if you, so I ask this to all my guests, if you were to leave a piece of wisdom, a life lesson that you've possibly learned in your journey, and you feel this is the one piece of wisdom you want to leave with us today that everybody needs to hear, what would that be? Well, it's in the title of your podcast, and that would be to experience love, to fully fully embody and understand the curriculum of love and understand it in every dynamic and every dimension that you possibly can in every way, love of friends, love of nature, love of your house plants, love of your children, romantic love, intimate love, like learn love. And you can never go wrong if you fully master the curriculum that love has to teach you. Oh, wow. That's so great. I have not heard that one. And it's so powerful because you. you know how they say the opposite of love is fear. And there's only one or the other. Uh, uh, Gary Zukoff was on my podcast and he talks about that simple message. Like it's, you know, that it's one or the other. There, There's no in between. So, of course, if we can master living in love in everything we do, like how, how amazing would life be, right? If we could only live in that in every single moment, <laughs> you know, so right. mastering it. Yes. That's so great. I, I love that. Thank you so much. So where can people best find you more about you? Of course, it will be in the show notes, but. Yeah, you could just go to altercall.com. It's A-L-T-E-R-C-A-L-L dot C-O-M. Or you can catch me on Instagram. I'm at Real Ryan Blair on Instagram. You share so many great videos too. I, I love all the wisdom you share uh, daily on Instagram. So definitely go check out Ryan there. And if you were to just like, if is there some books that you would say everybody needs to read? Like a couple books that have been really a game changer in your journey as an entrepreneur or even, you know, doing the inner work, sp spiritual journey, whatever it may be, some books to leave us with. Yeah, I... I've, I'm a, I read a lot of books. I, I have probably five to 10 books arriving at my house a month, maybe more. Yes. And I'm constantly sourcing books. So it's a hard question for me to answer because I try to extract a piece of wisdom from each of them. There are some authors though, that I really like to dive into. Like I've loved learning from Malcolm Gladwell or John Maxwell, or, you know, I've, I've been privileged to learn uh, from Tony Robbins in person and some other, you know, great mentors and leaders like that, that I've, I've tried to dive into their wisdom and understand what wisdom do they bring to this world. And, and mm -hmm. so, you know, th and I was just with Saad Guru, for example, and it was wonderful for me to learn about his wisdom. And, and although it's not a shared wisdom, you know, I come from a Christian background and he comes from the yogic background. I saw so much that aligned us. And so I'm a constant student. I'm, I'm studying different ancient traditions and wisdoms and different ways of being to try to perfect and cultivate my own way of being in such a way that, you know, meets my values and my um, ancestry and heritage. Um, but ultimately, the most important book that I can read personally is the Bible. I, uh, you know, I have um, a system that I use every year. I just take uh, the Psalm plus my, my year plus one, basically. And that's the Psalm that I study and contemplate on. And so this year I'm 45. So it's Psalm 46 that I'm diving into, which is very fitting uh, because it's, you know, be still and know that I'm the Lord and uh, in, in times of trouble, seek God, uh, seek refuge in, in God. And, and so that's my contemplation this year. And then I'll study around that contemplation and I'll study other mm -hmm. stories within the Bible and I'll study other thought leaders on those stories within it as well. So interesting. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Well, this has been phenomenal, just everything. And it's great to just learn a little bit about what you do in your life and how you've really done the inner work and transformed your identities and 
many, many, many ways. So thank you, Ryan, for everything. And thank you for the patience with this technical difficulty. Oh, it's, it's fine. I have a funny story for you real quick, though. That's the other day I was leading a meditation. I had 450 people in it and the camera went dead. <laughs> and and there was what? 450 people mid meditation. All of a sudden my staff is like, the meditation's over. And like, I'm like, oh no, like all these people just got dropped. <laughs> Did they come back on or was it just that compu- uh, Yeah. My part of the meditation was done. And then someone else kind of chimed in and said, I'm sure Ryan will come back. And we scrambled to get the computers back up and the cameras back up. And, but the meditation officially ended in the middle of that uh, moment. So wow. uh, the wow. technical difficulties we experienced here today are, you know, are no big deal. I'm used to them. Yeah. I mean, you kind of just have to roll with the punches. I mean, yeah. like I kind of laugh at it sometimes. I'm like, really? Another new problem? Like what? Okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. Well, well, thank, thank you for you having so me, much. Erica. Yes. Thank you.